Good afternoon. Thank you so much to Sages for the opportunity to present and for Dr. Goldblatt and Dr. Slater for the invitation. So today I'm going to be talking a bit about um, our experience in the literature looking at laparoscopic open and robotic inguinal hernia repair in adults. So these are my disclosures. I am a proctor and speaker for Intuitive Surgical, and I'm also a speaker for W.L. Gore. So as you know, over 20 million inguinal hernias are repaired worldwide every year. 700,000 of those are repaired yearly in the United States. As many of us also know, men have a higher risk in their lifetime of developing an inguinal hernia, around 30%, and women have a much lower risk, around 3 to 6%. Inguinal hernias are 8 to 10 times more common in men than women and have a peak prevalence younger in life, as was discussed in the earlier panel, and then later in life as well. So the open inguinal hernia repair is still performed quite extensively throughout the United States. The most common mesh type repair performed is the Lichtenstein repair, which came about in 1984. As you can see pictured here, it's a tension-free open repair using mesh surrounding the spermatic cord and fixating it um, inferiorly to the shelving edge and superiorly as well. Now, the laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair originated in the 1990s, and there are two main types discussed in the literature, as was alluded to earlier. The transabdominal preperitoneal repair, which is pictured there at the bottom of the screen, where you actually make the preperitoneal flap, and then the TEP repair, which is totally extraperitoneal. You get into the extraperitoneal space, typically using a balloon dissector in sufflation without violating the peritoneal cavity. So for the talk today, I want to focus first on what the literature tells us about open versus laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair, and then I want to go into um, the literature regarding robotic inguinal hernia repair. So when looking at open versus laparoscopic hernia repair, what are the clinical outcomes that we've identified? So this was a landmark study published in 2004, the first really looking at open versus laparoscopic mesh repair of inguinal hernias. This was a study of 14 VA centers where over 2,000 patients were randomly assigned to either get an open or laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair. So with their two-year follow-up, they found that the laparoscopic repair had a higher incidence of complications. You can see almost 5% compared to 2%, and that was statistically significant. Um, higher incidence of recurrence as well at 10% compared to 5%. Interestingly, neuralgia was decreased in the laparoscopic repair group um, at about 9% compared to 14%, so I'll talk about that. Specifically in regard to neuralgia, the laparoscopic group in this study, and again, this was back in 2004, showed less pain the day of surgery and at two weeks. But when the patients were followed for more chronic groin pain symptoms, so three, six months, one to two years, there was no difference compared to open in terms of groin pain. And then in the, and you can also see for return to daily activities and to work, higher incidence early on in laparoscopy where patients functionally did better the day after the day of surgery and at two weeks. But once you get to three, six months, a year, and two years, the outcomes in terms of functional status are the same. So what they concluded from this study was that the open technique is superior to the laparoscopic technique for mesh repair of primary hernias. Now, one thing that's important to note from this study was that the difference in recurrence rates I mentioned were about twice as much for the laparoscopic repair at this time, 10% compared to 5% open. Interestingly, when they subdivided surgeons based on the number of laparoscopic cases they did, in surgeons who had performed less than 250 laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair cases, the recurrence rate was greater than 10%, and in those who had performed over 250 laparoscopic cases, the recurrence rate was less than 5%. There was no difference in the open repairs performed by surgeons in terms of their incidence of recurrence. So I think this study really highlights the importance of the learning curve, especially in laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair, which has been a bit of the issue in terms of its adoption compared to open inguinal hernia repair in adults. So there's been a lot of studies since that time. So 2004 was really that first big landmark study, but since then there's been numerous, numerous studies. This was one, just one example published in 2018. It was a meta-analysis of 13 randomized controlled trials, around 2,600 patients, looking at 
the TAP laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair compared to open. They found no difference in any of the perioperative outcomes, such as hematoma, seroma, urinary retention, infection, or recurrence. Those were all identical. What they did find was that the laparoscopic repair did have a lower rate of paresthesia. So similar to this, um, the findings from the 2004 study I mentioned, you can see that laparoscopic repair was favored in terms of paresthesias postoperatively. Laparoscopic repair was also favored in terms of shorter return to work and normal activities. So you can see return to work for a laparoscopic repair was around 10 days compared to 17 days in the open repair. Um, and return to work was about 16 days compared to 26 days. So what they concluded from this study was laparoscopic and open inguinal hernia repair have equivalent postoperative morbidity and recurrence rates, and laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair has faster recovery and decreased paresthesias. And overall, a lot of the studies find very similar things. Like I said, there's a lot of studies in the literature about this. Um, but essentially, the main conclusions from the literature are that in terms of recurrence and perioperative complications that I mentioned, open and laparoscopic repair are relatively similar. Obviously, in certain patient populations, the obese population, there are certain indications more for so for an MIS approach. But this is, in general, what the findings have been. In overall, in laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair patients, functional status is improved, Re um, increased return to work, and short-term groin pain is improved. There are some studies that talk about chronic groin pain. Some find that chronic groin pain is worse in open inguinal hernia repair, and some find that it's, it's not. So that, that's still a little bit out for debate. But overall, short-term groin pain and functional status are improved with the laparoscopic approach. So what are the summary of recommendations then that have been instituted amongst our societies to tell us what to kind of do in terms of how to approach inguinal hernia repair? So this was published from the Hernia Surge Group in 2018, International Guidelines for Groin Hernia Management. So one of the statements made is that when a surgeon has sufficient experience in the technique, so this is what I was mentioning before about the learning curve, laparoscopic techniques do not take longer than an open repair, so in terms of operative time and morbidity to the patient. Another statement that was made in the guidelines is when the surgeon has sufficient experience, there have been no differences observed in perioperative complications or recurrence rates between the laparoscopic and open repair. And finally, as I was mentioning, laparoscopic techniques have less chronic pain and a faster recovery than the Lichtenstein repair. So some improvement in functional status and quality of life that have been found to be present with laparoscopic repair. So how does robotic inguinal hernia repair fit into all of this? So the robotic inguinal hernia repair performed is typically a TAP approach. As you can see here, the instruments are wristed. You saw some videos of robotics earlier, seven degrees of freedom. Um, you make the peritoneal flap very similar as you would to a laparoscopic TAP approach. So what are the clinical outcomes? So this was a study published in JAMA Surgery, the first of its kind in, um, in specifically in robotics, is the RIVAL trial. It was a multi-center, prospective, randomized trial of six sites. Uh, we had 102 patients in the group, and the patients were all unilateral, primary, or recurrent inguinal hernia patients, and they were randomized to either a laparoscopic TAP approach or a robotic TAP approach. So what we found was there were no differences in any 30-day outcomes, so wound events, readmissions, pain, quality of life, all of those were the same. Ergonomics was also something that was studied in this uh, particular um, in, in this particular format, surgeons were ex examined by external observers in terms of the different ergonomic capabilities that they were using during the operations, and they found no difference in ergonomics. What they did find was that the robotic approach had increased operative time. This is not surprising. This is something that we found a lot in the robotic literature. So about 75 minutes compared to 40 minutes. The specific metrics where OR time was increased robotically was the hernia dissection was longer, mesh fixation was longer, and peritoneal closure was longer. The type of mesh used was pretty standardized throughout the entire um, study just to make sure there was congruency. 
Cost was also examined. Again, also not surprising, something we found a lot in the robotic literature, $3,200 versus $1,400, and this looked at OR cost and disposable cost. We also studied frustration levels using the NASA TLX um, and workload, and we found that frustration level was higher with the robotic approach compared to the laparoscopic approach. So what was concluded from this study was that there is no clinical benefit to the robotic approach for straightforward inguinal hernia repair compared to the laparoscopic approach. Robotic approach did incur higher costs and more operative time, again, something that we find as a common theme in the robotic literature with added surgeon frustration and no demonstrable ergonomic benefit to the surgeons in this study. Now, most of the literature on robotics, specifically in hernia repair, are actually retrospective case reports, clinical cohorts. So the study I just mentioned was the first prospective randomized trial that we have in hernia repair, specifically inguinal hernia repair. This is another study from the prospective hernia study group. Um, this was published in 2020. So this is 17 institutions, 500 patients. This study actually looked at robotic, open, and laparoscopic patients. I'm comparing specifically first robotic versus laparoscopic. So the operative time again was increased, 83 versus 65 minutes, and this was true for both unilateral and bilateral. This study was interesting in that they also looked at pain postoperatively, so pain pills taken by patients were comparable in both MIS repairs, and then comparable time to return to normal activities for both the laparoscopic and robotic approach. Now, when you compared robotic to open, the increased OR time was identified in the robotic group only for bilateral. Otherwise, for open and robotic unilateral hernia repair, the operative time was actually the same. Pain pills taken was significantly less for the robotic approach, around six compared to 15, and then decreased time to return to normal activities, three versus four days. Now, for all three approaches, quality of life at three months and post-operative complications were comparable. So this is very similar to the literature I was telling you earlier about the laparoscopic versus open approach. So what was concluded from this study is that inguinal hernia repair can be formed, performed effectively using robotic, laparoscopic, or open approach. Operative times were obviously longer, as I mentioned, for robotic versus laparoscopic approach, and then time to return to normal activities were comparable when you look at the two MIS approaches, robotic and laparoscopic. However, when you compare it to open, both of those approaches, pa patients were able to return to normal activities sooner. So the main conclusions from the literature, again, for robotic inguinal hernia repair, there's a lot of different case, case studies, institutional studies out there, almost all of which are retrospective except the rival trial that I mentioned. So overall, what the literature has found for robotic inguinal hernia repair is that the complication profile is similar for all three types of hernia repair, robotic, laparoscopic, and open. We've found in the literature in general, and I said, as I've said, this is ubiquitous across specialties, not just in hernia repair, but robotic inguinal hernia repair has increased operative time and cost. So we really need to kind of figure out as time goes on what the role specifically is of robotics in inguinal hernia repair compared to laparoscopy. That is something that we still have not quite identified. So overall, laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair has clinical benefits over open with less chronic pain and faster recovery. That is steadfast and has been proven in the literature for quite some time. Robotic inguinal hernia repair does offer another MIS repair. The question is, what is its role exactly? And is there a difference in the learning curve compared to laparoscopy? That study I mentioned before in 2004 where it took surgeons 250 cases to get half of the recurrence rate. Is that really true with robotics? That's something that's still um, really uncertain at this time. Robotic inguinal hernia repair research is still evolving. We have not yet identified an inferior clinical benefit, but obviously operative time, learning curve, cost, all of those things are incredibly important to keep in mind. So thank you so much for the opportunity. And I'll, I guess we'll do the panel for questions. Okay, great.